everyone, I'm Mr. Fan Chulri, I'm a PSC candidate of AUSN. Today I'm going to talk about ethical principles and challenges of palliative care in Australia. As palliative care is a very sensitive issue, my main focus is how cultural factors indirectly control this palliative care. Uh, first, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what is palliative care and a little uh, knowledge I'm going to share. Uh, palliative care is a special kind of patient and family centered healthcare system that focuses on the effective management of pain and other distressing symptoms while incorporating psychosocial and spiritual care according to the patient or family needs. Um, the main um, goal of the palliative care is to ensure peaceful death and fulfill all the requirements uh, uh, for the patient who is dying. So, on the other hand, the process of palliative care is fully controlled by ethical judging and choosing as breaking bad news to cancer patients is a sensitive issue. Although Australia is a multicultural country, it generally follows the basic concepts of Western ethics in palliative care. Some patients and families may find that this is not suitable for them. In Australia, because of high regard for personal autonomy, the patient is usually directly told any good or bad news because healthcare professionals consider it is the right of the patient to make decision. Uh, because I grew up in Bangladesh where uh, the family is brought into the discussion from the beginning, I found the Australian system to be different. I also want to compare the situation to that in the United States uh, as uh, my PhD research is about palliative care. Um, this paper, uh, this uh, presentation provides a brief idea about some of the fundamentals of palliative care in Australia with a focus on ethical dilemmas while dealing with patients from different cultures. No matter where we live, we need continued efforts to mainstream palliative care into the existing healthcare system for its feasible and sustainable public health approach, parallel with the training of healthcare providers to balance between ethics and cultures. Uh, I'm going to talk about some ethical principles for palliative care in Australia. They uh, mainly follow eight princi principles. Uh, those are assessments and recognition of physical and mental needs of the patient uh, at the end of uh, life. Uh, secondly, they focus on involvement of patient families and carers for end of life planning and decision making. Uh, regardless of income, patients receive equitable care and support in Australia. Uh, patients with uh, dementia or cognitive impairment receive all the facilities within residential aged care. Uh, then end of the life care is delivered by appropriately trained and skilled healthcare providers. Uh, patients, families and carers of end of life care are treated with di dignity and respect. And uh, patient uh, spiritual, cultural and psychosocial needs are respected and fulfilled there. Uh, and finally, the families, carers, and residents are supported in environment. Culture and palliative care. Australia is a multicultural country following Western ethics, uh, as I stated before, uh, which is based on patient's autonomy. Western ethics supports patient determination, informed consent, and breaking bad news directly to patients. In contrast, its star ethics is more, more based on family values where relatives make their decision at the end of the life care on behalf of patients. Uh, therefore, often we can see ethical dilemma uh, arises for many Asian Australians and other Australians who grew up in more family-oriented cultures, including those from Muslim or Buddhist societies. In Eastern ethics, it is often strictly contraindicated to disclose the truth of illness to a terminally ill patient. Family members are required not to tell anything to their beloved one who is going to die for the sake of the patient's psychological health. For example, 
my mother in Bangladesh, my mother always requests the doctor uh, not to tell anything about her health issues to her. Just uh, she asked us to talk to my father, and uh, uh, she wants wants my father to make all the decisions about her health. <laughs> Uh, she's totally dependent on us about her health issues. <laughs> and um, self-determination and palliative care in Western ethics, it is strictly indicated to inform the patient directly about the terminal illness or for treatment options available for him and support fully to make the decision by himself. They respect the patient's self-determination even if the decision is opposite to the recommendations of the healthcare providers. Western ethics also supports refusal of treatment of passive euthanasia if the terminal patient doesn't want any treatment that is legally uh, their right, that, that is their legal right. In few countries or states, a patient may request a physician-assisted suicide. Uh, my research, uh, <laughs> what I did, uh, in order to understand more, I'm researching academic papers and government policy documents as a PhD student. So uh, I'm also interviewing different persons from different cultures on their experiences of palliative care and I'm also exploring what I learned from my uh, encounters with the healthcare system in different countries and I'm also reflecting on my cultural experiences as I learn from everywhere I go. So I would be grateful if you provide me uh, your experiences uh, so that I can uh, I can do my research on my PhD. <laughs> Thank you. And here's the conclusion. <laughs> ethical dilemmas are com uh, common in palliative care. The approaches to resolving these ethical dilemmas vary with cultural factors. As the ideal palliative care is mainly of providing the best relevant care to the dying patient, spiritual and cultural factors should be considered for the betterment of the patient. An effective uh, protocol should be developed to avoid conflicts between Eastern and Western cultures of palliative care in a multicultural countries like Australia. Healthcare providers should be trained to handle ethical issues by discussing with patients, family members who is chosen to make the decision by the patient. Uh, this protocol also supports patient autonomy directly. This approach is essential to ensure balance between uh, sometimes competing ethical principles, uh, differences in the involvement of the family members and choice over palliative care in a multicultural country. Here are some references. Uh, I would uh, really, really appreciate to receive your comments. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. Do you have some, and then she'll give you her email by writing, there was some <laughs> conversion. Uh, and you have a few copies of a printed yes, survey you can give to people. And who has some questions or comments? Yes, sir, sure, please. Uh, yes, um, most really the nice presentation. I really like what you're doing. I was wondering, what is your PhD thesis on? Like, uh, your hypothesis, what is that? Yeah, it's an uh, international, I'm um, working on international survey of cancer care and palliative care. Mm -hmm. So uh, my target group is uh, mainly the patient's family, relatives, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, already uh, have experienced uh, their uh, uh, so some uh, uh, who who are very close to someone uh, receive palliative care. So uh, my uh, ultimate target is to uh, provide some guidelines of uh, how we can uh, incorporate the ethics, bioethics in palliative care properly. Uh, especially uh, now, I'm focusing on the cultural factors uh, because uh, also the religions. Uh, they yeah. they uh, they have uh, different uh, expectations from from this palliative care. Uh, 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 yeah. I was also wondering, for example, in America they have hospice. So if your life expectancy is less than six months, you're going to the hospice care. 
let's say, stage for something else yes. cancer. And in Turkey, for example, we don't have hospice care. It yes. is not a concept at all in Turkey. Yes. And we also discussed this during our ethics lectures and what what is the situation in Australia? Yeah. Um, is there hospices? Hospices? Yeah. Uh, in Australia, they're also providing uh, this. Actually, uh, I mean, we hospital. don't provide the care, but it's not called like that. Yes. In Bangladesh, uh, no one knows about hospice yeah. care. Yeah. <laughs> so in Australia uh, and other countries, first world countries, as they are providing the palliative care, they are trying their best to uh, yeah, uh, ensure the peaceful death of the patient mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. relative satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can check the number of hospices in Australia. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, please. You had a question? I actually still don't get the concept of what is a palliative care. Is it more like a help the people before they die or yes. uh, so you slide. suffer or something like that? I'm not quite sure. Uh, yes, uh, a palliative care is a separate uh, department of the hospital as far as I know. Uh, where the only the uh, terminally ill patients are treated uh, and uh, to ensure their peaceful death, to reduce their sufferings mm -hmm. and uh, provide their uh, needs of, of all the psychological and uh, social needs, uh, mental support, everything. Can you show the eight principles of palliative care? Yes. The same like hospital? Hospice. Yes. Okay, so these are eight principles for uh, palliative actually, care. Actually, it's a state-by-state -state approach and also principles uh, which uh, Australia is following. First, they assess and recognize the uh, physical and mental needs of the terminally ill patient. Uh, for example, the cancer patients, of stage 4 cancer patients. So, uh, they know that they are going to survive one or two months or has six months. So, uh, what what their uh, expectant, uh, expectancy from the last days of uh, their life? Mm -hmm. So uh, ultimate goal uh, of palliative care is to provide uh, those needs. Uh, they comfort the patients. Mm -hmm. So you more like mm -hmm. they they provide pain management medications and counseling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, but yeah, in fact, so for palliative care, so if you decide that somebody is likely to have a terminal illness, they may be given the option not to receive such aggressive treatment, uh, but to decide we're going to uh, treat you to provide relief from the pain the direct physical pain, provide emotional support, provide other psychological support, and that this will be the way that you're going to uh, treat them, but no longer aggressively to try. For example, you may decide not to do surgery because surgery will be yeah. uh, um, not helpful. Terminal, not helpful. And just they may die or mm -hmm. just too much suffering and pain. You just decide to let them pass. Have you come across any special cases of biological issues related to palliative care? Uh, I don't have uh, personal experience of that. Therefore, I'm trying to uh, know about others' experience. Experience? <laughs> yes. Um, so, does that that find Palliative care is for those who have been admitted in the hospital, right? Yes. Like my mother was uh, for six months in my in our home, and we took care of her as family members. So I'm just wondering, what is the knowledge that we don't know? About? Yes. Yeah, because we we can take care as family members, but we wouldn't know how exactly the hospice does it. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in, in Asian countries like uh, India or Bangladesh, uh, palliative care is a very new concept. So uh, most of us, we don't have uh, enough knowledge of palliative care. Uh, 
uh, therefore uh, I choose this subject <laughs> to learn more and research and to do my PhD. Okay, any other comments? Yes? But uh, research since yesterday, so I'm skipping the concept, concept because it's really interesting. But um, you are writing a PhD candidate and writing a PhD thesis, and um, I'm wondering is uh, uh, my question is um, methodology. So you told me about uh, uh, you want to take IT. Yes. But you are also gathering the question of So which one do you want to focus on quantitative research or quantitative research? Yes, uh, I actually uh, now I'm going for survey. Uh, because first I wanted to do quantitative research, which would be really tough for me. Uh, therefore, now I'm going for survey. Interviews, case interviews. studies. Yeah. So quantitative. Yes. Qualitative. Qualitative. <laughs> Yeah. Not quantity. Yes, it's. Um, so do you need a survey? It, she's using the, the term survey to refer to interviews. Uh, so you want it's to a structured this? interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, the reason why I ask you why, because the survey, um, you prepared your question. Yes. And basically, we you suspect the answer, yes or no, or writing? Uh, yes, uh, uh, both, yes, no, and uh, some uh, brief description of. Uh, um, Informants are very tricky. Yes. And the survey, um, writing survey, and uh, talking narration is not Yes. So we have to care about the um, uh, attention about the. Uh, a survey sometimes gives you a bias. Yes. <laughs> so, and the more and more people talking, they are talking not content of the changing. Yeah. It means uh, the first contact. People know that you are a um, dentist. Yeah. So mostly patient. So top-down relationship, paternalistic relationship. So, is it try to answer what you want? Yeah. So, um, psychological is there very, very obedient to dentists. Yes. But the more and more changeable, it means that making the rapport, they took uh, honestly. <laughs> so, um, um, we have to be careful about uh, which one is really the feeling. Yes, and it's very sensitive issue. When uh, I'm going to collect some data, about the uh, patient's relatives, uh, where some uh, ho some close relatives who already died, uh, that that hurts that person. I'm indirectly hurting that person. So, of course, my target group was the uh, doctors involved with palliative care, the nurses, the um, the relatives, and also the patient. But uh, when I <laughs> I jumped into this research. I found it's difficult uh, because it's a sensitive issue. And each time uh, I'm going to ask for the information, or uh, uh, if I ask to uh, request someone to fill up my questionnaire, it it, it may hurt them. According to my bitter experience, yes. um, talking. Talking to patients and make them speak in a different yeah. so they never speak. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> be patient. Yeah. We have to be patient. Right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your solutions. <laughs> so I'm looking at any cultural uh, aspects and uh, 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 the questions related to cultural aspects in your questionnaire or in your qualitative interviews. Uh, now just um, going for the survey, quantitative study, um, because uh, also um, uh, now I'm trying to 
uh, collected uh, from different cultures, people, different religions, different nationality, what they think about palliative care and what their suggestion about palliative care. How uh, a different nationality or a religion uh, can ensure uh, a best palliative care. For example, in, uh, in Islam, we, we uh, prefer to... In Islam, our, our mentality is like that. Uh, uh, the last days of our uh, life, we will just uh, recite Quran and we'll be... Uh, <laughs> Also, uh, this this type of uh, mentality. That, therefore, uh, in Muslim uh, of uh, Bangladesh or other countries, uh, they are, uh, they may not be interested to take palliative care because this palliative care is mainly provided in the hospital. So uh, we need to create that type of hospital for uh, separate re religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and, and, and it's, it's really tough. Yeah, and I think that uh, from my understanding in Malaysia as well as in India, um, there are many people who still think that you can't send people who are sick to the hospital for palliative care. Yes. Because then it means that they are like, sent to old folks home, you send it to somewhere yes. else to be taken care of. Yes. And uh, they would rather have, it means that person and people have abandoned it. Yeah, yes, the yeah, same thing. My my, uh, my mother and my aunts, uh, they are not interested to send my grandmother to for palliative care. They are just taking care of, uh, of taking care of her in in our house and uh, in a separate room with <laughs> nurses. But they are not interested uh, because of uh, uh, that uh, re religion also an important factor. <laughs> a lot of people now, based on that also, and because of the, in America certainly, the cost of the hospital and the, the whole dynamics of the hospital, the hospital doesn't know what to do if a person is yes. you know, in that state. So palliative care has become a thing of the home, where the palliative care workers come to the home. Yes. Yeah. Even in the hospital, there is also the palliative care committee the group that works with specific issues around people who are in the hospital in that stage of life and make helping the families with choices and education. But now more and more people who want to pass in their own homes, there's a whole group of people who go to the people's homes and there'll be a nurse assigned and twice a week she'll go to the family's home so that the person can pass within their own environment. There's one cultural story, if you would like another story, that was one of my favorites from the things I read in a palliative care and cultural context in this amazing and wonderful book called The Scalpel and the Soul at this frontier of medicine and culture. Um, so this particular culture goes outside of most of our domains. The gypsy queen was passing and the family, all the family members, brought her into the hospital because they didn't know exactly what to do and she was had, had some seizure or something and so they brought her into the hospital and they all stood around her and of course they knew that they had to light candles so she her spirit could go with the fire. And this is the hospital in the modern world and they start to light candles and there's oxygen and everything everywhere and the security guards lost it and took all the people and were putting their hands behind their back and someone had the good wherewithal to call the chaplain and see if he could negotiate something. So he came and told everyone, just calm down, please don't light any fires. Let's go in the other room and discuss what we could do. So he took a whole family in the other room and said, okay, so what can we do besides lighting fire? You know, because this will blow up the hospital, so it's not a good idea. So um, they said, well, look, she needs to go. You know, her spirit is ready to go. So they said, well, how can we let her go besides with fire? They said, either she needs the open sky or we have to light fire for her. So the chaplain was very smart. He took the bed, which of course kneels in the hospital. They went into the elevator. They went up to the roof of the hospital where the people could land if they needed to the sky light. They put the hospital bed on the roof, the people stood around and 
did all of their prayers and she left. <laughs> It's another medium between the science and the medicine and the culture and how the spirit is oriented and how the community is oriented. It's to be sensitive. Cultural context would be a very important part of politics care. Belief systems that everyone holds. Okay, well thank you very much, Nasrat. Thank you.